meeting with Steve Chan today, running for City Council in District 4 for the City of Costa Mesa. Thank you for meeting with us. It's always nice to see you, Brandis. So for those that are confused, because district voting is new to our city, can you explain uh, where your district, the best you can, where your district lies, and then who else is running for your district? Sure. Our district is south of the golf course, which is the bike trail, and it, that's the northern boundary. The southern boundary is a about 17th Street, but it's only two blocks wide down there south of 19th. And it's uh, Placentia on the west and Harbor on the east with a couple of dog legs where the uh, social nightclub and that whole uh, shopping center area, that's not included. Uh, my opponents in the race are Manuel Chavez. Uh, he's running on Katrina Foley Slate and uh, Michelle Figueroa Wilson. And she's running on the Republican Slate. Yeah, what is your connection to Costa Mesa? Um, this is one of the questions a lot of our voters are asking this year. So what have you done for the city so far? Well, I've been in the city for nearly 27 years and uh, close to 25 of those have been two doors from the soup kitchen on 19th Street. And uh, that environment leads to a lot of, let's just say, situations. So back in uh, the uh, eight years ago, for example, uh, I led the neighborhood charge um, when the Garcia Recycling Center was abated. And uh, that took several years of hearings. They were processing about four million pounds of glass a year. And uh, the negative impacts from that uh, splashed, oh, about a third of a mile into the neighboring residential neighborhoods. Um, I also was involved in the uh, Roland Barrera Maison bar fight, if you will. Who, who likes to brag that they're in a bar fight? <laughs> uh, but this, uh, the bar was red tagged as the band arrived to play one March sunny day in uh, 2015. And ever since then, we are now in our fourth year of uh, continuing the fight with that bar operating above the law um, four years later. And uh, I'm also pretty heavily involved in uh, the Smart and Final situation there along 19th Street. Uh, Smart and Final never had a liquor license to sell alcoholic product uh, past 7 p.m., but they had been abusing that privilege for a decade or more, and not just in Costa Mesa, but in 22 other cities across California. Do they get fined for that? Uh, the ABC has a very lengthy enforcement cycle, and uh, since that occurred, we caught them doing that in October last year, September, October. The enforcement cycle is 18 months for ABC. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen yet. It seems like you have something against alcohol. Well, it's just that I'm, th those are my neighbors, and a lot of the negative impacts, uh, they spill into the residential neighborhood. Frankly, with the respect to the uh, smart and final situation, well, I have nothing against the sale of alcohol. However, those sales uh, should have gone through honest cash registers. So you're not against bars in the city, just bars against bars in neighborhoods? Well, no. Actually, the, uh, uh, the ABC itself, their mission is to foster maximum availability of alcohol. And 90,000 licenses, licensees in the state, there's a whole lot of them right next to neighborhoods. And <clears throat> it's very mature law, ABC law, that uh, there are a lot of provisions that the ABC uses to facilitate neighborhood bars and those bar those provisions are meant to uh, pr protect the uh, neighboring property from impairment but there are mechanisms there to have those bars there you had mentioned uh smart and final they were selling alcohol and everything um what what's going on with smart and final on 19th street well the impact from smart and finals unlawful sales they were bootlegging alcohol into our community for many many years and when you look at the mom and pop markets that uh, surround Smart and Final for a two to four block radius, they were all just kneecapped with that action uh, for a very extended period of time. Now, when you look at West 19th Street and you compare its uh, vitality to say Harbor Boulevard on the north side or 17th Street and you wonder, well, why is 19th Street have this downtrodden look? It's because these small businesses are actually injured. They don't have uh, uh, money to paint the outside. They don't have money to paint the inside. Uh, they don't have money to improve the products that they 
sell to the community and service the community with. And uh, the biggest hit was to El Matadi. El Matadi is the city's largest Latino grocery store. And when Smart and Final went through their 2012 remodel, they probably took well over half of the, not just the alcohol sales, but the grocery customers, tens of millions of dollars of ill-gotten revenues. Uh, and that has really hurt. That's economic blight along West 19th Street. A lot of those mom and pop markets get blamed, like the liquor stores, they get blamed for the downtrodden look, when in fact, the truth of the matter is, is that the, the one that's inflicting the negative impact is the one with the fresh paint job. That's smart and final. When you're out on the campaign trail, what are the complaints you're hearing from your voters? Well, you know, there's a, a lot of the obvious in-your-face issues that uh, face Costa Mesa that we hear about nonstop, and that those being the homeless, uh, transient problem, the residential treatment industry, public safety is a big one. Um, and some of the ones that uh, are not so much in your face that we hear about, it's just this whole uh, partisanizing of local politics um, and uh, a, a clear perception that a lot of times what's happening in council chambers is uh, preordained. Decisions are being made before the, the public hearings. What decisions or how is that happening? Well, take for example the, uh, <clears throat> the bar that I'm next door to. Um, we went through quite a few hearings at the Planning Commission as well as the City Council regarding this venue. And during the pendency, by the way, during the pendency of all those hearings, I was going through a refi on a mortgage there. And the lender, as was their right, were what they were pulling uh, appraisals as we were going. And in 2016, in an up real estate market, uh, before the bar and after the bar appraisal, well, we lost well over $100,000 in appraised value. Prior to the city council hearing uh, in January of 2017, Wendy, yeah, she sent me a note that said, uh, Katrina wants that bar. <laughs> and, you know, the fix was in. Wow, that, that's shocking. Well, it was shocking to us, and we felt uh, on Center Street, I had uh, three or four of my neighbors and I attended a meeting on the fifth floor. We felt that we were the, probably the first citizen meeting that uh, uh, Katrina took when she was mayor, and we all left that meeting stunned, frankly, um, that uh, it was quite apparent that uh, the decision had already been made. Uh, and John Stevens and Katrina Foley, while they were polite in that meeting, they railroaded us. You said Katrina and John, you met with them. What about the other city council? Why just Katrina and John? Uh, during that uh, meeting, actually we had scheduled with the assistant there in City Hall a series of meetings. And that meeting, it just seemed that they just dragged it on so that we missed Alan's meeting. It was scheduled next. So you said Katrina and John, like were they a team or? Actually, they make a very good tag team. Uh, I've noticed that in many uh, public hearings, and a lot of people have commented that uh, also to me. Um, and, uh, you know, John will consistently talk about teamwork. And in fact, uh, him and Katrina are, are, are a very strong team. Uh, and they've chosen a side when they're playing as a team. Wouldn't that maybe be better for the voters if they're voting for certain issues and it's supported by both John and Katrina, wouldn't it be better that they're a, such a strong team? Uh, not if you want balance. What you're getting is one side. And unfortunately, because of the partisan nature of city governance these days, uh, that could have been a funded decision. And how do you plan on your, if you get elected, you're going in there and you're going up against this team. How do you plan on getting your voice heard? Well, it's, it, you need more than a voice on the dais. You actually need a vote. Uh, and uh, you've, one of the first things I would like to do if I'm successful is to revisit the whole districting issue because the six districts plus an at-large elected mayor is certainly not what the people wanted. The people wanted five districts uh, and they really wanted equality on the dais. So Katrina back then uh, in 2016 when it was proposed by Jim Righeimer yeah, she was pretty vocal about her opposition to that. And John, he also uh, campaigned uh, with a position against the six plus one districts. Uh, but they have since changed their position. 
It's not surprising with Katrina because Katrina has a long history of uh, supporting uh, issues that frankly impact negatively uh, our neighborhood. For example, she voted twice uh, with respect to the recycling center uh, abatement nu uh, as a nuisance. Uh, she supported that. Uh, she has voted consistently, and John votes with her consistently in support of the bar that continues to operate above the law. Uh, when we tried to uh, ask or force uh, Smart and Final to stop bootlegging alcohol into our community, that was during Katrina's tenure as mayor, and we did not get a uh, good reception at City Hall to this at all. And what's shocking about that is that uh, the liquor license itself for Smart and Final, it says right there on it that the reason it has a prohibition on alcohol sales after 7 p.m. is because there's a senior citizen center right next door. And I believe still to this day that the city should be acting to protect the seniors. Uh, so you mentioned a lot of uh, issues. So how can you fight, let's start with the nonpartisan issue. Costa Mesa City Council is supposed to be nonpartisan. But we do have the OCGOP backing candidates and the DNC backing candidates. How can you make it nonpartisan? Well, I think that the way to do that is to educate the voter, perhaps one voter at a time, in my district at least, and uh, then you can get down below the uh, noise that uh, is kind of overwhelming. And the voters are bombarded with these in-your-face issues. If you bring the issues that they uh, that you can see are under the carpet and you bring them to the surface, the voters tend to recognize that right away. And you've got to educate the voters. Now, with the um, you mentioned uh, sober living homes. So, outside of what the city's already done, what more can you do to address sober living homes in your district? Well, in our district, because it's so small, uh, less than a square mile, uh, we probably will have the least density of sober living facilities. But in general, uh, I would continue the city's efforts to lobby in Sacramento to make changes. And there are a lot of other uh, tactics to use to try to mitigate some of the negative impacts. For example, a very often heard complaint regarding the sober living or the residential treatment uh, facilities is the secondhand smoke issue. And I would advocate that the city pass a uh, uh, smoking uh, related ordinance, such as the one that Calabasas has. It's probably one of the most stringent in California. And uh, it would apply to uh, places like apartment buildings. And that would mitigate some of these uh, negative impacts. Another thing that I feel pretty strongly about is that I feel that because these uh, businesses have commercialized our neighborhoods, that the city should consider uh, a certification program, much like an organic food stamp. They have a stamp of approval that says, oh, this is organic. And that might allow the city some more leeway in actually getting in and checking that the facilities are complying with uh, rules to, that, that will make them good neighbors. Now, would you support candidates taking campaign funds from sober living homes? That's a, uh, a mixed issue for me. You can't really tell the motives of a uh, residential treatment operator. Um, it's, it's kind of crazy, you know, if they were successful at what they want to do, they'd be soon be out of business. So it's kind of a quandary there. You mentioned public safety. So we need, I'd like to hear how you plan on addressing public safety, but also to add on to the last question, what about candidates that take money from police and fire unions? Well, that's uh, another quandary. You can't really stifle the union's voice. And uh, however, at the same time, you're going to be negotiating with them in terms of their uh, MOUs, the benefits that they receive, um, I'm all for, and I believe strongly, that uh, in the last couple of administrations that our uh, first responder force has been uh, wrongfully uh, cut down in size. A lot of the uh, in-your-face issues that 
impact public safety in Costa Mesa weren't foreseen and we were caught flat-footed. So a lot of the public safety concerns that I hear, there's not enough police on the street, they're not visible enough, a lot of that can be attributed to wrong-headed policy making at the city level. So I would support absolutely bolstering, uh, especially the police department. I'm very concerned about the overtime levels that uh, both police and fire are paying. And uh, if we had a uh, disaster, for example, I'd be very concerned about our first responder levels. So you support more hiring? I do support more hiring. And what about the pension crisis we're facing? The unfunded pension, uh, that's a, a, an account that is hurting many, many municipalities across California. The uh, proper strategy for that in the case of our city and, and probably all the cities is to aggressively pay that down and not just pay it down but not when the payment comes due to pay more and of course ideally the, the uh, ideal place to be with that is to pay it down, stabilize it and actually build it to a surplus. But I support fully paying it down aggressively. What about homelessness? Um, you had mentioned that was another concern in your uh, district, I believe. Uh, how can we address homelessness better? Well, actually, what, it used to be a problem uh, more or less central to our district and also District 5 because the District 4 and District 5 host a lot of the social safety net uh, organizations in Costa Mesa. But in the last four or five years, that situation has kind of exploded citywide. So it's gotten a lot more visibility. Uh, in 09, I was meeting, uh, or trying to meet, uh, at the time, Mayor Pro Tem Wendy Lees in the Smart and Final parking lot because the behavior of a small gang, if you will, of homeless folks there was really as extreme as you might see today. And I wound up being uh, taken to jail. Uh, one of the homeless folks had uh, uh, sworn out a citizen's arrest on me and uh, said that I was inciting a fight. Um, and of course the judge threw it all out. Um, but yeah, it's, very, it's, a, it's a very contentious issue. This was before the Homeless Task Force was formed. Wow. Yeah, but with respect to the, the homeless uh, and transient issues in our city, I think that one of the things that folks should be aware of is that in the federal litigation in Judge Carter's courtroom, relating to the Santa Ana River Trail, one of the things that's really come out uh, is the fact that uh, 29 out of the 35 cities or 34 cities in, coast, in Orange County really don't do very much and don't want to do very much with respect to the problem. And I think that uh, in Judge Carter's courtroom that they will be uh, forced to step up to the pump. And as these other municipalities uh, and the county also uh, begin pulling their weight, uh, the burden on Costa Mesa will be lessened. I don't really support expanding any further social safety nets here in our city outside of what I call uh, supportive housing. Supportive, permanent supportive housing uh, is a uh, solution that puts crisis management there seven by 24. Uh, it puts a roof over their head, but in terms of a shelter environment, I think we already have enough shelter environments within our city. So you've been actively working on issues that a lot of people are complaining about now before ever running for city council or considering it, huh? Well, yes. And again, it's because I've lived right adjacent to 19th Street. Um, and those negative impacts have been spilling right over. District 4 is kind of like a canary in a coal mine. Um, and I think that the city has grown to realize that uh, what's good in District 4 is really good for the whole city. You know, you think about Costa Mesa and you think, well, from the soup kitchen to South Coast Plaza, that's quite a, a, a disparity there. And um, the issues that we're faced with, they're really not issues that we should be, especially these big issues, the op opioid crisis, the homelessness, uh, these are nationwide problems, and we really have been pulling our weight. We really can't be expected to solve them on our own. During the last election, the biggest issue was development. 
Thanks to Measure Y, that has slowed down, but how do you feel about future development in your district? Well, our district is the smallest district. We're, as a city, 16 square miles. We are nine-tenths of a square mile, if you count out to the middle of the street. Uh, each of the districts has well over 18,000 people. We are extremely dense. If it were really intelligently and carefully planned, redevelopment should take place in our district when you have some of these really older buildings. But uh, one of the biggest complaints that I hear from voters in our district is the uh, uncharacteristic development that the high density uh, is representing in our neighborhoods. It's truly changing the character of the neighborhood when you have a three-story with the open space on the roof next to a one-story house. If you were not running for city council, who would you vote for in your district? I would probably withhold my vote. And what are your plans on the uh, future of Fairview Park? Well, in the last election, in the 2016 election, we did put together a very strong measure protecting Fairview Park. And I think that the, um, uh, the thing to key in on is to really look at where the loopholes are in terms of uh, what would have to go before the voters. Um, that thing is protected pretty well. So I think that outside of small things like turnarounds, et cetera, where they invoke public safety to uh, uh, put that in, we're, we're, we're really protected on Fairview Park. And we should keep it that way. With everything going on with your fight uh, against that bar, how do you feel about Katrina Foley being removed as mayor when she was advocating for that bar? Um, when we first heard the news, or we talked about the news, because I watched that hearing where Katrina was removed as mayor, uh, one of my neighbors that attended the fifth floor meeting with John and Katrina back in December of 2016, uh, she actually danced in the street with joy when she heard that news because she had felt so bullied in that meeting. And to add uh, more insult to the injury, uh, Katrina had used her wor own words of opposition against her claiming that they were words in support. So yeah, on our street, um, the uh, negative impacts from uh, those decisions, they reverberate and folks were uh, quite ecstatic to see her removed. Now, why? Final question, why should the voters vote for you? Well, I think that in the entire field, I'm the oldest guy in the field. I've been a, the voice for the West Side for 10 years or so. And uh, if you look at the city truly as a nonpartisan uh, decision-making body, then you really want to avoid the extremes. And I would commit to the voters that I will not make decisions before the hearings. I'll hear the facts presented within the hearings itself and I'll properly consider those facts before I make decisions. And that's what I think I'm hearing most from our voters in our district and outside the district as well.